Hello, everyone. Um, we're just going to wait a couple more seconds uh, or maybe a, a minute for uh, some folks to, there's still some, a whole bunch of people signing in right now. Um, I want to thank you all for taking the time to spend your afternoon with me, uh, for at least for an hour, uh, to go through some some stuff. And thank you all for the questions. Uh, there's been a lot of great questions. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through all of them because there of so many that came in, but I'm going to try to do my best. And some of them I actually grouped together um, because there's uh, several that were um, uh, very common uh, as far as uh, um, uh, the, the questions and the content or the, maybe the, the angle of where you're going with the question. Um, so I'll do my best uh, to reach all of that. And um, let's give it one more second and I'll open up my screen. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm clicking a few things here. I hope everyone's doing well with uh, as best we can in this uh, in the pandemic, and things are moving slowly toward normal for everyone. Um, and let me get the show open. Kate um, and Caitlin, can you all see my screen yet? Yes, we can. Okay, which screen are you seeing? <laughs> I see uh, the Urban 3 lab number two screen. Okay. You're all good. You see, am I full screen? Yes, you are. And second slide is up. Correct. Okay. So who you've just heard is uh, my colleague, Kate Ryba. Um, Kate's gonna moderate the conversation from the outside. She'll be in the uh, questions panel. So you'll see in your control panel, uh, there's, there's a, there should be a, a, um, a button to press inside the chat room to ask questions. Um, feel free to add in whatever you'd like as I go along. I'm gonna, f I'm gonna go through the questions that were pre-submitted first um, to about uh, 30 or 40 minutes in and then take a break. Um, and at that point, we'll get to wherever I got and um, move into PowerPoint DJ mode where we'll take the questions that have sub been submitted um, in the webinar. Again, thank you for all of your time and thank you for, for coming to this, but let's get to onto the questions and data. Uh, my name is Joe Minicosi. I'm the principal of Urban3 um, and uh, let's get into some information. So one of the questions, uh, this, this actually came up in the, the last lab um, obviously, there's a pandemic going on, um, and what, what, how do we look at the data going forward in cities? So, so what is the post-COVID city? Um, the analogy that I like to, you know, there's there's a lot of like biases that people are upset with density, or they think that density causes a, a greater significance of of uh, of COVID spread. Um, and really, there's some data points that are emerging. Um, there, there should be more data. There's, there's more testing that needs to be done. But the, the, the sample that I use is this, actually this New York Times article that gives us some indication of how we should be looking at the data. And this is from last month. But um, the New York Times finally started getting into the per thousand analysis. So the data was there. It's just no one was publishing it. Um, and the New York Times took a crack, which is great. So you see that New York is, um, you know, less than Milan. But what's telling telling in the data is the one right below New York, which is Albany, Georgia. And you see that Albany is uh, about half what New York is. And Ar Albany is nowhere near the data density or the, the people density of, of New York City. So, you know, we just thought, well, let's go ahead and expand the table and bring real density into it, which is area and, and people per area. So the, the far right column here, you'll see that we did the uh, cases per 100,000 per square mile. So this is going to give us a better idea to see, is there, co is there a correlative effect between density and COVID cases? So you'll see New York is at 0 0.061 um, cases per 100,000 per square mile. And that's actually equal to uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts. So who would have thought that Pittsfield, Massachusetts is you know, a, a, a cauldron of, of COVID spread. Um, but if you look at the data, it's equal to New York City, yet we read about New York City all the time. We hear about New York City, and a lot of that's just because the media resources are there. 
So the data shows that uh, it's co the density there isn't isn't correlative, and is even worse as you look at something like East Strouds, Stroudsburg. Um, so you know, we uh, Will Creasy in our office produced this graphic to show relative density. This is the density of New York. Here are the density of other the others on that table. Um, and you can see what the density is. Now, the density of cases is a different chart. That's this one. So let's put the two of them side by side. This is the the, the case, the density on the left versus the cases per 100,000 per square mile on the right. And you can see that uh, Pittsfield, uh, Massachusetts is like, what, 1 40th uh, the density of New York. Yet when you look at the cases, they're equal. So, you know, my understanding of the data that's available, the data that's out there in this article, um, in particular in this space and time, the dan that there is no correlation between density and, and COVID spread. Um, obviously, we're big maps people, so we, you know, look at maps all the time. And, and it's funny, if, if you looked at this map, you'd say, okay, Charlotte is where all the, where all the dense, where all the COVID is. And it's, you know, it's because there's a lot more people in, in, in Charlotte. So when you, if you ask a different question, which is the cases per thousand, you get a different map. So you can see that actually that our problem in our state at this moment in time was actually up near Norfolk, Virginia and not in Charlotte. Uh, Washington Post actually has several maps that are pretty cool and you can see on them, uh, the lower left, uh, Greer, uh, the county of Greer, Oklahoma is actually worse than Oklahoma City. Or you can see that um, Southeast Indiana is worse than Indianapolis or Albany, Georgia, Southwest Georgia is worse than Atlanta. So, you know, just, not totally conclusive at this point, but it's just this is what we would talk about if when asked the question about density and COVID, um, there, there, there isn't a connection. Um, but this comes with one huge massive caveat. There's not enough testing. Um, we aren't doing testing the same in all these places. Testing in Milan is different than testing in New York City. And I think that's the bigger question to be pointed out that in this post-COVID environment, we need to be, well, one is understand the value of data and how it helps make decisions and being able to see it. Um, rather than falling back to a bias of am I for density or against density. Um, and then finally, if we want to just look in the space and time, cities have had pandemics before. This isn't this isn't new. Um, and many of the past pandemics were a lot worse. So cities have survived that because they're incredibly powerful economic engines for humans to to, to habitate in. So it's, they'll be here long after uh, this this pandemic is over. So from a recovery standpoint, however, um, you know, there's cash flows of how cities operate and we need to pay attention to them. And also COVID is going to affect some industries faster than others. And we're seeing this with restaurants and retail shutdowns and the slow opening um, in a um, socially distant environment. So knowing that data of how you operate and being fish, fiscally resilient, you need to understand the rules of what controls how you run your community. So this is a chart that we do. Uh, uh, we keep as a um, as an analysis of how local communities operate. When I say local, it's city and counties combined. But these are all the different states and how they operate. Red is property tax, green is retail tax, and the bluish green stuff at the top is is sort of income tax or other forms of taxation. So every every state operates differently, and it affects a local community because that's your purse strings. So if you're on the left of this chart in Maine or Connecticut, you're pretty much operating your city 100% off property taxes are pretty close. If you're on the right of this chart, um, you're dealing with more sales tax and sales tax is being affected quicker and faster and harder with COVID than property taxes. And we've seen this before. We saw this in um, uh, uh, the, the last recession that happened um, in 2000 and, and peaked in 2009. But this is people's income tax dropping because you're out of work. So that's obviously going to precipitous effect. And what follows that is people's ability to buy things. So that's going to affect sales tax. Um, so there's a strong correlation between sales tax and your personal income. Property tax is a different, a different sign curve. Um, and it, but it's still got a drop that happens usually as a lag. But knowing these cash flows and not being dependent on any particular one um, uh, strain is going to be helpful for your community. You want to diversify your revenue streams, and if your state has restrictions, then communities need to start advocating for change. I was actually just on a telephone call or a webinar with the state of Colorado and the municipalities there because the cities in Colorado are, are almost wholly dependent on retail tax, and that's not good for those cities. The county gets the majority of the property tax. So we talked about uh, adjusting or, or lobbying for changing 
uh, two state policies. One's called the Gallagher Amendment, the other is called Tabor, that actually control the purse strings in the community. And, and we need to have those conversations. Uh, um, Josh McCarty in our office, our, our chief analyst, um, ran this chart on drawing the current, uh, you can see the drop that happens in retail sales. And then when, when, you know, when Josh published this data, he's like, well, you know, not so fast. This is just um, the data that's out there. It's not adjusted for inflation. When we adjust for inflation, and you can again see the drop that happens with COVID in this last couple of months, this is what, what adjusting for inflation looks like. So from a real standpoint about our, our retail taxes, we're actually all the way back to the 9-11 disaster um, and retail sales. Um, what you can see in this data is that our retail sales has, has modified. There was a stronger growth that was happening um, up to September 11th. And notice how it sort of flattened out um, in, the next, in the next arc. Well, that's because consumer behavior changed. Uh, we did, did a lot more transactions on, um, on the internet. And also people just stopped buying as much stuff. Um, you see this particularly after the recession. Um, you don't go out and buy TVs. You let your car last longer. You know, think we, we adjust habits um, based on what happens with our economic conditions. And we'll experience the same thing coming out of COVID. People's habits will change. So cities need to think about that and adapt. But we also have to have a conversation with our states about how we're constrained in those environments and the choices that are being forced upon communities at a local level because of state policy. Those places in this green triangle are going to feel it the hardest. Um, you know, we're, we're currently uh, uh, working in um, Edmond, uh, Oklahoma, and this is their local, the city revenue of how they have to pay for a city. 76% comes out of sales taxes. That's not good. That's not that's not a healthy way to run a city when you're when you're stuck with that much of it um, coming from one source. Um, so you know, obviously going forward, having a diversified uh, revenue base is going to be more healthy for them. But also we have to talk about what what kind of shape our states are in. Um, this is from the National Tax Foundation website, but this shows states that have reserve accounts or let's call it savings, so that they can actually deal with. Um, rainy days that we're all in right now with COVID, that, that the state can actually help their communities within it. But Kansas is going to have a really hard time when they have no savings. Um, the other data point to look at are the states that are actually very dependent on retail taxes. So coming out of COVID, the states that are going to actually be in the, the most difficult position are going to be those that have no savings, but also are dependent on a cash flow at a state level that isn't going to be Coming back anytime quickly. Um, so Louisiana, Nevada, New York, um, Hawaii, those are the states that are going to be feeling at a, at a larger level a state impact in addition to the city impact. Um, looking at retail um, individually or at a smaller level, not all retail is the same. Uh, we did a project in Durango, Colorado. Again, the cities there run off retail tax, but here's the property tax. So the county gets the lion's share of this. So the county, you can see, should be all over helping downtown. Um, South Durango is where the retail strip is. So every community has got one. This is where the mall, the Home Depot, the Walmart, all that's down here. This is the retail productivity. So downtown's crushing it in retail tax, total productivity, jobs. Um, you know, basically downtowns are the golden geese of, of communities and you have to feed them, but also understand how they're productive and how to keep them going. They take this, they take a significant investment, but you get a, a massive reward out of them. Uh, there are a couple of businesses that actually shared their uh, retail taxes with us, uh, Tim Wheeler and Peter Schertz. Peter has a bookstore and Tim has a coffee shop. Um, and we pulled Walmart's data off their annual reporting. Um, but here's the, the footprint difference of those places, but here's the property taxes difference. So who would have thought that those two businesses are paying 15 times the property taxes and five times the retail taxes of a Walmart. And again, that's the data. So once you have that information, you can you know, have a conversation about what's more productive and also jobs. Um, what we found is you know, just asking simple questions and, and talking to the community. Um, one of the things that we asked the community is, who do you think's paying their retail sector employees more per hour? The people on the right or the people on the left? Probably the people on the right, right? Um, who do you think's hiring uh, the local website designer, the local ad executive, the local um, attorney or accountant? Is it going to be these people or is it going to be these people? 
these are all economic spins inside our community, but we have to make the information available for people to see it. The other thing that we measured was what happened in the recession. So we had enough data to see here's downtown is this top layer, here's the, the, the South Durango area, the strip is a lower layer. And you see the dip that happens with everybody. Everybody, all retail sales dropped across the whole community in the recession. But before the recession, downtown was about 86% of South Durango. After the recession, downtown climbed up and grew to be about 91% of South Durango. That's one data point. So we could actually say, okay, downtown is catching up to South Durango, but is downtown doing it by adding more retail square footage or what other questions do we need to be asking? And just by asking that one next question of measuring square footage, we actually saw that downtown only added 17,000 square feet of new retail. Meanwhile, South Durango was adding 300,000. So pound for pound, dollar for dollar, this little stuff was crushing it and growing retail sales. So I would take this chart and let's add the next the next four to five years. Let's go up to 2020 and see what happened with this data. This is all information that's sitting inside your community that you can look at and ask those questions to see what's what's working and what's producing wealth and how do we grow our wealth at our community level um, and, and grow forward. So um, one of the other questions was about working from home um, and what data sets will help illuminate that. Uh, right now, it's too soon to tell. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of businesses that are going to shift uh, that will continue with a, a, a large section of folks that will stay in a work home environment. But there's a lot of people that can't do that. There's a lot of businesses that can't do that. So until we start seeing data on how the business operations change, I can't tell you. <coughs> Excuse me. If there's one indication of human behavior, however, that'll tell us that we're probably going to go back to normal in the way things were. Just look what happened this past weekend. This is Ocean City, Maryland, um, on 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 this weekend. You know, did I mean there's seriously there are people with masks on in this picture. I like how she's using her mask as a chin strap. You know, cities are essentially places of human interaction and even though we're in the middle of a pandemic, people are going out of their way to get together, you know? So businesses will still need that. Our habits will go back to that because that's what we've been doing for tens of thousands of years is living in cities. So I suspect that a lot of our, our normal will go back to it, but there will be an adjustment. Um, there are several questions about tax increment financing uh, for transit facilities. Uh, this is a question that whether I, I suspect is that, you know, limited funding for the federal, state, or local, um, and how do you use tax increment? Tax increment is where you actually engage in either a tax deferment or some other form. Uh, this is another question about uh, how transit agencies can use their land. That's actually, a, I can connect that to the TIF, as well as uh, is, is, is uh, bus rapid transit um, and using, using funding like that to fund that. So I'll, the three of these are kind of connected in, in a broader sense. Uh, think of this as value capture that your investment, how can we capture it to grow and pay for the things that made it valuable? So the short answer is yes. Um, what was interesting is in the same vat of questions, uh, there's somebody in the audience was was sort of not not in favor of TIF. So how do, you, how do we as planners convince elected officials that sales taxes and big boxes and TIFs are not the answer? So, you know, short answer to this is I disagree with this. Um, I think TIFs are an engaged way of of making decisions, but I also disagree. I also agree with this question that sometimes TIFs get abused. So let's just show, well, I'll walk through a TIF example real quick. This is Leander, Texas. Um, we did a project there with uh, with the North Line project. Uh, Leander asked us to evaluate a TIF project for um, a development that was at the end of a train line. So outside of Austin, out in Leander, the region ran a train line out to Leander and dropped a train station right here. And you know the general market was just dropping boxes, but the community was like, well, you know, we we actually think this developer's idea for this mixed-use development on the side of the community college is something we want to support. So <clears throat> the, they're going to jam a bunch of apartments next to the campus, which is smart. They have a main street spine that was going to go through here, a parking deck, uh, mixed-use buildings, and then townhouses between the downtown area and the the college and then a bunch of townhouses toward uh, the train station. The reason why a lot of these developments don't happen this way is because of the carrying cost of putting all this road and infrastructure in before you get a cash flow pretty much makes it 
that a developer would choose to do a suburban pattern. You know, simply put, if you're going to make me put in more infrastructure and it's going to take me more time to pay for it, it's going to put me out of business. This is the reason why suburbia happens the way that it is. It's the lowest form of investment you can do to get your cash flow to happen the fastest. So if you're setting up a tax policy that does that, can you eliminate that tax constriction um, on, the, on the system? So we ran the numbers. So here's phase one, where you start your main street spine, start building your infrastructure, build your park. And again, you don't wanna be in that environment until that park's there and the street's there, but that's all expensive to build. And then they start maximizing by adding housing around the outside and eventually they thicken up. So it takes time. Here's their tax model of their whole city. Um, they're not doing so great. It's pretty much all suburbia. They they grew up at the wrong time, basically. They're mostly a, a post, uh, most of their city was built after 1970. Um, but you know, here's if you add downtown phase one, phase two and phase three. So this is a completely different animal, but it adds so much more potency to the community because you know, simply put, they just didn't have a downtown. They're not like their cousins of Georgetown and Round Rock who have been built in, since the 1800s. And you can see their downtowns here and here, right? So they're gonna be basically adding a downtown here and it's like, boom, you get a big hit. So what's crazy is that that takes their average value from $275,000 an acre for the whole city. And, and almost doubles it to 500,000 citywide. That's incredibly potent. It takes the top of their model from this lower red spike at three, let's call it 4 million an acre, and jumps it up to about 70 million an acre. That's highly potent. Now to show you Georgetown and Round Rock and these little purple spikes that you see here, I mean, that's nothing to write home about. It's just like little two-story buildings, a three-story building, this is nothing. But you can see how potent those buildings are. And they're talking in Leander of doing four-story buildings which is not skyscrapers, but you saw the wealth change um, in, in doing this. So these are two and three story buildings. This is four story buildings. Um, so little buildings can be highly impactful. This is the TIF. Basically what's happening is they've got an agreement with the developer to split the taxes 50-50, um, where the city basically foregoes that tax payment and that white blue triangle right there goes to pay down the cost of all the infrastructure. So the developer is putting the infrastructure in and basically saying, tax me less for it, is, a, is a, a crude way of explaining it. But the developer is actually paying in half into the pot. So they are paying some taxes. Here's phase one, here's phase two, and then the, the, the tax increment vaporizes in 2031, and then they go right into full taxation. So you start to see is basically this is a leveraged investment to invest in making a wave happen in the future. So you could argue that that's a, that's a gift to the developer. But you can also argue that that's an investment into future value. Um, and then here's phase three. So had it not been for that investment, the developer would do a lower investment vehicle to make the project happen. So just to show you what that looks like, even at half tax payment, so we just basically snapped a chalk line at 2025 right here. So not even full in, just about halfway in. Um, and this is what it looks like. So even at half taxes, it's so much more potent than everything else around it. So seeing the relative experience of, yeah, you're giving away that light blue stuff in the thermometer here, but you're getting so much more than everybody else is putting in. Because baked inside the tax system are breaks, basically synthetic tax increments uh, to residents. There's lots of tax breaks that go to residential property. Um, and we'll go into those in a second, but here's it full built out. Um, two of the counselors were just like we shouldn't do anything let's just let big boxes happen and we're like all right we can run that so here's here's downtown at 700 million uh there it is and then here's like your traditional conventional big box stuff this is what is completely doable and reasonable and perfectly legal under the zoning so do you want to have um 60 million dollars of investment or 700 uh, do you want 60 or 700 so if if you ask me if it's worth it to invest 20 million dollars of the tax deferment to get $600 million more money, I'd say go for it, you know? So this is this is how you can use TIF to leverage into the future. Now, um, as far as using your own land, back to the second question in that sample, um, what can you do to control your value going forward? Um, the example that I'd point to there is a project we did in Salt Lake County uh, for Ben McAdams, who's now, um, who's now a congressman, but he was the mayor of the county and he was interested in, uh, uh, what Dog Detter is promoting in his book, Public Wealth of Cities. Dog's awesome. He's from Stockholm. Um, and we talked with him on the phone. It was funny. He's like, you know, when we're in, when we're in Amsterdam uh, 
and we have an old hospital and that hospital has become obsolete, we use that asset to convert it to a hotel and we basically charge rent on the building and convert that public asset into a wealth building fund that basically buys down artist housing or we'll, we'll take an old port facility and leverage that you know three billion dollars of property and public investment to get 10 billion in private capital to build more jobs more housing basically we're holding on to stuff we could use this is another port facility in copenhagen uh where they're getting a, a, a university workspaces housing units and that was all tax free before now you're going to be producing tax dollars and solving other community benefits in the process so um, mayor mcadams asked you know what are we sitting on in our county so we did an analysis of Salt Lake County. Uh, this is the property tax model that Josh McCarty did. This is the retail tax model. And you know, in filtering through the information, you find some low hanging fruit, like particularly around the transit lines. Um, uh, Josh did a transit oriented cookie cutter um, down, the, down the train line and grabbed everything that was within a five minute walk shed. So it's about 3% of the footprint of the county, but it's producing 11% of the value. So that's like a, uh, from a footprint to ratio production, that's about a one to four ratio. So what is the what do the municipalities own, the city, the county, the state, the feds, and the multiple cities inside the county, inside the system that they could use? And there are other cities that have been down this road. We recommend looking at older places. Boston uh, has done this with its transit authority, uh, real estate, Seattle uh, um, did this public-private development with leveraging land that they owned and using uh, um, basically to negotiate uh, what happens on the property. Uh, so they were able to leverage getting uh, affordable housing and a lead platinum building, a public plaza, and basically use your land in partnership with the developer. So here's all the publicly owned parcels. Um, now clearly we're not going to take the whole university over here and just turn it to private, but you know there are a couple of par parcels in there that you can put in the mix. So um, you know we filtered through the information to basically use these and just say let's just Put them in a reasonable play of what they could grow. So basically, the, just those parcels could grow 50,000 uh, more people being housed, uh, you know, more jobs, 40,000 more jobs. But also, what's crazy is right now it's all non-taxable. That could produce 13.5 billion dollars of new value into the community, which is amazing growth, and it's currently all tax-free. Now this this is us being moderate and conservative with with our assessment on on the valuation. Um, you could discount that even further if you wanted to have even more affordability or artist housing or whatever. Just you can actually solve this problem as a government. You are sitting on those properties. Um, countywide, you know, this is after you know we didn't we didn't throw like the the airport is this white box right here. We didn't put that in play. But just, you know, you're looking at about 44 square miles. These are the building footprints on those 44 square miles. But so just putting this 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 brown area into play, that's going to yield $45 billion of new taxes or new, new taxable value. So when your entire county is $131 billion in value, adding $45 billion to that is is quite productive. And you have all the controls because it's your property as a government to put strings attached on what you want out of it. You know? So you can actually put that in play. Now, from a development standpoint, developers need speed. We need to understand what the agreement is, how to move forward, and time is money to us. So as long as you understand that in your partner, you can go into a partnership to do things like what Seattle did. So that's our recommendation at, uh, at that level. Now, um, back to this quick question about the abuse of, of, of TIF. Um, you know, obviously there's good TIFs and there's bad TIFs. We've seen abuses, we've seen really bad investments. As long as you're you're going forward with open eyes in, in, in analyzing what works and what doesn't, what was a success and what was a failure, and just being human about it, there's gonna we're gonna make mistakes. But at a core, core, core level, we have to go all the way back to realize that all taxation has tax increment built into it. That there are suburban biases baked all into our tax system. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of my favorites. And this one I show at every presentation. This is just the dirt value per acre. So just how the dirt is being valued with no buildings on it. And you can see that up here in the upper left, um, all this is blue, which means $15,000 an acre. That's how you'd expect that whole neighborhood to be. But over here, you start to see all these weird little anomalies happening inside the system. This is human error. It's it's policy, it's math, it's mistakes. I mean, there's lots of reasons why that happens. Over here is policy. This is the commercial strip. 
you see this parcel is blue, which is 15,000. When you cross the street, it doubles to 40,000. So this is just how dirt's valued. When I was presenting this in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and I asked the audience, I said, why is land double the value when you cross the street in the same zoning category? How did that happen? And the tax assessor raised her hand and she's like, no, you don't understand. And I said, what am I missing? She goes, well, they have more land. The more land you have, the lower the value. I'm like, where did you get that? And she's like, that's our standard. So I, I actually went to the assessor's conference, uh, the national assessor's conference, and I asked them where they got that standard. Their magazine is called Fair and Equitable. And uh, I said, how is this fair or how is this equitable? And to their credit, they just basically, you know, shout, shouted back, it's not, we need to change that. You know, it's, if you're going to give me a discount for larger tracts of land, how am I going to use your land? And you're not charging me for the pipe, the three square, the three miles of road that's around the outside of it. So those are all tax breaks that are just baked right into the math of how we do our tax system. So I would argue that it, it, it behooves us to actually do TIF to solve these problems and start and start to remove these subsidies and or change the policy. Um, you know, at that same conference, the head of Walmart's real estate division um, presented to this amazing PowerPoint show on how junky Walmarts are and how cheap their buildings are to assessors. So think about that. He's basically in front of 3,000 assessors. The assessor's job are just to put price tags on things. And he's helping them out by showing them how junky his buildings are. I asked Mr. Terrell, I said, what's the useful life of one of your buildings during question and answers? And he basically shot it back uh, 15 years. We've designed the building in the last 15 or 20 years. We're going to maximize our depreciation, let the building go fallow. We'll build another building and start the depreciation again. The building's a throwaway for us. So, so the lesson in all of this is don't hate the player, hate the game. But we need to understand the game and how the rules are applied. So just here's a, another example in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, and we see this with lots of state policies. We always do these dummy shows of, of how, you know, we're just dummies in North Carolina. This way our tax system operates. We've got a, a market value. We get a taxable reduction to a taxable value, multiplier tax rate, and you're done. Ours is kind of simple. When you get into Missouri, this is the way their tax system works. They've got an assessed valuation, less exemptions but then their levy rates of how they, or their, their uh, assessment rates is where they, they mess around. So their, their commercial is assessed at 32% of value. Residential is only assessed at 19% of value. So, so just look at those numbers for a second and ask yourself, what's the difference between 19 and 32? Well, that's, you know, the laws are set by the, the state, but the difference is that it's going to affect the tax bill. So, if you're only taxing 32%, and this is the same $500,000 of value, you're really only taxing 160,000 of that 500. Well, the house gets this really big benefit of, what is that, 60% uh, of value? So when you look at these, these valuation models, realize there's two different tax rates going on, that all that beige stuff is taxed at 60% of what the blue stuff is taxed at. Um, or in Indiana, these are the tax rates, the caps on, on the residential. So if you're a homeowner, great, you're taxed at 1%. If you're a, um, if you're other residential, it's called renters, um, oops, uh, you're at 2%. So let me ask you a question. What's the difference between 1% and 2%? You know, usually when I ask the audience, like a lot of people just, they yell out 1%. I'm like, no, 2% is double 1%. So basically you're paying double in taxes if you're a renter versus a single family homeowner because that commercial property owner isn't going to just you know pay more taxes out of the kindness of their heart they're going to they're going to package that into the cost of rent and then why are we charging our commercial product three times more so that's just when you you know from a and i hate to defend walmart in this but in their defense if they can see that they're being taxed three times more than everybody else they're going to do everything they can to minimize that expense in their in their portfolio so, so again, just being conscious of this and asking whether or not it's fair, but also understand the ramifications. So in South Bend, Indiana, this is their value of what they should be in their community. So they basically own a $4 billion city, but they're only taxing it at, at $2.7 billion. So you're getting half the revenue of what it takes to run that city. And when you look at how it models on the ground, this is a model that Josh made to, to make it clear um, and basically showing what, where they should be taxed at and what you're not paying versus what they're actually paying. So you see this property owner takes advantage of a whole lot of exemptions versus this property owner. So this person's paying more of their tax bill 
than that person. But at a city level, they're losing $51 million of revenue every single year. That's crazy. That's a tax break. So as long as we're just conscious about this and just talk about the fairness and whether or not it works in our community, great. But you have to do the math and see how it works to make it work. <clears throat> um, this question, uh, how, do, how do you balance making a profit, capitalism, and sustainability at the same time? I didn't really know where you're going with this question. Um, and frankly, I don't have a problem with capitalism as long as it's beneficial to the community that can understand it. So, you know, Walmart's being capitalistic, but they're also showing the inefficiencies in the policy, and that's a self-inflicted wound. Um, you know, from a sustainability standpoint, you know, right now, you know, right now we're dealing with COVID, but we're going to have to deal with climate change. But running around and scaring people about climate change isn't going to help. And just realize that there were capitalists that have been down this road before, and the Nixon administration actually published this document called the Cost of Sprawl. So in that document, they talked about how sprawl is costly and destroying communities. It's also destroying the environment. So we can both talk about sustainability and capitalism in the same breath. And actually capitalism can help you to understand how to be more sustainable in the long run. So we know about the cost of sprawl and I would just say use the power of capitalism to explain it to people um, because guilting them isn't gonna work. Um, GIS, uh, can we learn ways to do your productivity analysis in our city without GIS software? Um, I don't know how to answer this one. Um, you know, it's kind of like saying, can you draw a building without AutoCAD? Short answer is yes, I can draw a building by hand. It's just going to take me a whole lot longer to do that. Um, so that, again, we recommend GIS software. We use Esri software. Um, QGIS is out there. There's other forms of GIS platforms. But basically, when you're dealing with, uh, you know, this massive pile of data and, you know, 600,000 parcels of information, um, GIS is a, such a powerful tool to use and most governments have it and we highly recommend it and we're, we, we love Esri software um, and, and use the heck out of it. Um, so that's kind of what we do. But um, how, do you, how do you frame an argument uh, to investment at the fringe versus downtown uh, in revenue? Um, the, the, you know, basically the, it's geospatial. The further you go out, the more it should cost and that's just a simple lesson of the economics of distance. But um, I'll show you an example of that. In Lancaster, California, which is outside of Los Angeles, um, up and over the mountain from Los Angeles, uh, we did their, 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 their model. They have a great team of, of staff there that are really asking a lot of great questions and doing some amazing stuff. So we did their math on their productivity, and then they asked us to measure their infrastructure. And so the, the thing that was most obvious was that they're carrying 953 miles of roads which is basically enough roads to go from Los Angeles to Portland. So we put all those roads on a, on a timeline. Uh, this is another Josh project where he basically broke it all out um, into when those, this is a best assumption we can figure out. It's not like date, roads have birth dates on them, but we can figure out generally when they happened. And they went on a little road building spree in the early 1900s and didn't really build a lot of roads until after World War II. But you can't help but notice what happened in 1953 with all of those roads. And so what happens when those roads get built, and it's usually developers that are building them and handing them over to the city. We've learned this with Chuck Marone and Strong Towns, and they get rebuilt uh, 50 years later. Well, when you're hit with that huge capital expense, most communities look for more money. So they let out more development. You've got to pay for this stuff, or you annex more land, you build, get more roads. So this comes back with a second rebuild, and it brings along with it this stuff. You know, roads and pipes are with us forever. So you have to keep on fixing them and replacing them. So this is the build rebuild. We stopped them in 2016 and said, you're not gonna build another road from here to infinity. Let's just see what your build rebuild schedule looks like. So that, that first wave was kind of crazy, but you know, every American city did this. We just basically converted our cities to suburban cities and we went ahead and doubled down on that. Um, and that was a choice. We set up policies, our tax system, all of that stuff set in motion that that was the path of least resistance, zoning codes, um, and now, because we've been doubling down on it, it's getting bigger and bigger without us adding any more roads. Um, and that's capitalization. That's basically, you, you build stuff, it gets more expensive over time, and it adds over itself. So that's what we're stuck with. Every American city, they can only afford basically about 50% of their roads. And that's the reality of their system. So rather than just charge an impact fee or just charge a flat rate, um, we basically broke it down into a geospatial methodology that, you know, that 
the cost of their roads is $50 million. Their deficit of what they can afford is this red box right here, which is about $25 million. So they basically upside down about $25 million a year and be their ability to pay for their roads. Um, in a recession, when you can't control the grants, other metro contributions, impact fees, because developers aren't building, this is what, or sorry, that's, that's what they can rely on. And here's what it looks like in a recession when everything compacts. So basically the recession and reliable income are about the same. So this is what we're looking for is basically taking that red box and sticking it on top as a separate fee and treating it like a, an impact fee or, or sorry, like a stormwater fee or something. It's called a transportation utility fee inside, inside the trade. So basically you pay for that infrastructure with a fee system because you're using it. Um, once they saw that they were over the, the two drink minimum or limbo bar right here, um, they, you know, they're, they're, they're prudent and conservative. They basically said, well, we can pack everything else down and charge less or use those funds for other resources. So this is what they're really looking at. Now in this next coming recession, uh, they'd be in a better position with their deficit than what they were in the last recession. Uh, density also matters in communities. Uh, you know, the taxable value of a buildings there in Lancaster is about 50 bucks a square foot. Parking's about $4. Or another way of thinking of this, you're taxing parking one-tenth the taxes of a building. So that means that's an incentive for parking. Um, secondly, the road's gonna cost you $22 a square foot in front of the building and $22 a square foot in front of the parking. So why is parking paying less taxes? So again, that's an incentive that's baked inside the tax system. Um, additionally, there's things like this. These are called cul-de-sacs. 10% uh, of the system are not part of the network. They're these dead ends. These are essentially publicly funded driveways. Now the cost to the community is about $2.5 million a year for each of those cul-de-sacs. So put a price tag on that. That's gonna be geo-specific. That's gonna matter based on your location. And that should be a community conversation. Should everyone in the community pick up the tab for those 10% that are getting that extra service? That's a question for them. Um, the, 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 the rates should differentiate based on distance because the further out that system, the more of the roads you're gonna drive on. So folks that are further out, if you're, if you're close or far, you should pay based on that that choice of your residential location from the center of town. You've chose to move out there, so you should pay for that that extra extra distance. Um, so basically, it breaks down to a four quadrant diagram. If you're low density and far away, um, the rate should be the highest. If you're high density and far away, that's better, but it's not great. Um, conversely, if you're in the middle of the city and you're wasting real estate, you don't have any building on the property but you have all of the infrastructure, the communities made their promise to bring services out there. So y'all on the private side should be paying a commensurate fee to at least keep up with that. Otherwise you're land speculating. And then for those that are high density and close in, those should be rewarded because they're the most efficient on the real estate and the public investment. So these are just the, the average of a monthly charge uh, that we recommended for each of those environments as a transportation utility fee to basically take care of those impacts, to basically balance the books of their deficit that, that's in and try to solve for some of those tax breaks that are baked into the system, but also make it geospatial, that is, there's a distance effect to that. So we're right at 40 minutes. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move to PowerPoint DJ. Sorry I didn't get to all the questions. Um, and with that, turn it over to Kate. Um, or I can dip into the questions I didn't get to. So Kate, do we have any questions? Yeah, we actually, um, not yet, but if anybody wants to contribute Kate? some, um, can you hear me? I'm not hearing Kate. Joe, can you hear um, me? Let's see. Are you there, Kate? Um, can we? All right, let me just no, go to back more questions then. Me? Sorry about that. <coughs> Got plenty of questions. Um, the next set is about, um, you know, if, if we reduce property tax rate on buildings and increase on land, would developments be more affordable and compact? Um, that is, uh, uh, there's Henry George, the, the policies of Henry George I'd recommend looking at. Um, I know Chuck Marone has done an incredible presentation on land value taxation, which is Henry George's stuff. 
but also Rick Rybeck in Washington, D.C. does a great presentation on value capture, which talks about tax increment, uh, but also land um, valuation. And there are countries where we've worked in Australia and Canada that actually dial up the value of land a little bit higher than the buildings. Um, but uh, that is actually connected to this question here, which is, um, what do you do with excess right of way um, and, and freeway connections? I didn't, I'm, I'm a, this, this question uh, is more of a statement than a question. I interpreted it as being this example of right, right of way conversion. Uh, locally, um, I, we actually do have an example here in Asheville of uh, there's a, right now we have a highway that comes up here, drops onto a local road, then kind of peels off. And since the 80s, we've been trying to get a connection here and basically get all this spaghetti untangled on our local road. But that brings forward an opportunity for all of this right away right here. Um, DOT has not been the easiest group to work with. If anybody's actually worked with DOTs, you know what I mean. Um, frankly, as a taxpayer, it bothers the hell out of me that they're just squatting on all of that real estate in our community and causing that impact. And it's almost like letting your plumber design your house. You know, if you let your plumber design your house, there's gonna be pipes everywhere because they're pipe people, but they don't understand the impact on the architecture. Um, conversely, you can see that, uh, or additionally, you can see that this is our public housing. Like what kind of insanity is that where you'd put your public housing in this moat of, an, of a freeway interchange and call that reasonable? So we in Asheville find that patently unfair. And we've been trying to get our state to get out of the way so that we could fix that um, and basically stitch that community back into the fabric of our community because that used to be part of a neighborhood called Chicken Hill that was basically urban renewaled out into this housing. And that's just wrong. So, you know, if we can move the highway, we can get all of this land back. That's currently non-taxable. Um, this would be a lot of property that could come back into our coffers and, and, and we can actually have better transportation systems in our community. But there's a cost to, to our state sitting on our property. So we went ahead and ran it. It's basically $111 million of, of taxable val of, of taxes on that property over 50 years. Now these are 2009 numbers. It's even worse now. We can we can harvest even more revenue and solve problems. We could have affordable housing, we could have artist housing. And you know, again, it's you know, I'll be honest with you, I feel that NCDOT, they're a bunch of goons. So what they've done, they, like this is this is the plan that they handed back to us. It's like, how do you use any of that land when you're like consuming all of it for these loopy interchanges and all this stuff? They just can't understand urbanism. So for the question about right of way, yes, you could do something like this. And I'll show you what we did in, in New Zealand. It's actually based on this. Oh, by the way, what I love about this, this drawing, this highway right here, that's three lanes this way and three lanes this way. If you just go just to the right of this picture, it's only four lanes. Like how do the cars reproduce in this roadway and produce more children um, in the roadway? But this is the kind of insanity that DOT uses because again, they're, they're just thinking of pipes. It's super fun to have a car drive really fast to an interchange, but this is in the middle of our downtown. Like, why would you do that? Why would you race to real estate? Anyway, um, obviously you can tell that it winds me up. Um, Henry George uh, property taxation is, uh, is commonly referred to as land value taxation. And, um, in land value taxation, uh, basically you're you're taxing the land based on the 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 valuation that should be there from all of your investment. Um, Henry George promoted in the late 1800s. There's some great literature online. The Lincoln Land Institute has a lot of great documentation on this. But the the, the story that I like to tell is about Elizabeth Maggie Phillips, who was a Georgist, and you know she thought that it was great to think about land rather than buildings as the value producer. You know, simply put, if I if I build a granite building, why should I be taxed more than somebody that has a a, a, a wooden tilt up house next to me? You know, it doesn't mean that I have more wealth. You know, let's say I care about architecture and I wanted to have a beautiful granite building and I put my entire life savings into it. Why are you taxing me more than the person next door around the same street? So um, the other thing is true that if you're a family that stepped off the Mayflower, you could sit on land in downtown Boston forever and just bequeath it to your kids. Meanwhile, everybody else is doing the effort to make a city valuable and your your property value goes up, but you, your taxes don't. How is that fair? So think about how bad it was in the 1800s when all these immigrants were coming over to America and, and, and loading up our cities. And yet there was rampant land speculation. Um, so Elizabeth Maggie Phillips, who has incredible eyebrows, um, she thought that it was patently unfair and there's gotta be a way to teach people about land value taxation. So she invented a board game 
uh, and you all know what that is, it's monopoly basically, but it was called the landlord's game and it was basically to teach us the value of land. Um, and if you think about the rules of monopoly, what's important, location, land assembly, and putting buildings on it. So she's taught all of us this, yet our tax system does the direct opposite. And this is the 1800s, surely, it's been 200 years, surely we could modify our tax system to something that was more fair and equitable and actually work the way the cities work. Um, and there are countries that have done this. Auckland, New Zealand, um, they have a heavily land valued uh, system. So the same with Australia. Uh, we showed them that I-26 thing and they immediately figured it out. They're like, and you can see their density in Auckland. And this is a, this is a land, a, a figure ground just showing where all the buildings are. And you can see how much they use their land in their core versus American cities. And you can see the, the, the valuation commensurate return off that investment, particularly down the transit corridors. And you can see them like mountain ranges. And they saw these holes in their fabric and they're like, what's going on with these holes? And we said, well, one of them is a highway interchange and the other one's a lake. So you can't fix the lake, but you can fix the highway interchange. Um, and this is, the, this is the knuckle right here. Um, so we did an analysis of if they got rid of that highway interchange because it's redundant, um, it would basically yield $80 million more in taxes to fill that hole in, and they'd get more ridership, they'd better use, utilize that transit line, um, and they're moving forward with it. In Australia, same deal, high, high land valuation, um, so you're going to see a maximization of the real estate. Queen Bean is an incredibly suburban area outside Canberra, um, and here's, here's Canberra, here's Queen Bean. And just to show you the, the, the physical effect of what happens in the community, um, now again, this is ridiculously suburban by uh, Australian standards, but check out their, their core area of their city. That's how they do a mall in Australia. Uh, it's got a surface parking lot, that's suburbia. Um, and uh, you can see how their housing is, is closer together. And again, if you have higher value placed on land, you're gonna be more conscious about how you utilize it. So that is indeed a mall. It's got a Target, it's got a Coles, it's got all of that. It's also got an underground parking structure. Even though it's got a little parking lot up here, most of this is sitting on top of a parking deck. And that's that's their version of suburbia. Um, so, see, we're at 50. Kate, did you ever find a way back in? I'm still not hearing you. Joe, oh, can you hear me? Um, Sorry, everybody. For some reason, see. Joe, but all of you can. All right, we've got 10 more minutes. I'll kind of go into some more things. Um, you know, one of the, the, another question that came in is what are the three recovery options for local leaders? Um, and just before we get into any of the, any of this, this stuff, just measure your failures and stop doing it. Um, uh, look at your retail first. That's gonna be the most immediate thing and double down on your potency. The stuff that's producing wealth, uh, reinforce it, um, add more value to it, uh, try to find a way to, to keep it healthy. Um, and then also be honest with your community. Tell people about the subsidy. The, the average citizen doesn't, isn't aware of how the tax system operates, even though we all pay taxes. And, and right now, um, when the music stops, when we're in this spot of chaos, but also there's not a whole lot going on, now is the time to just to check in on everything. This is data points or, or times to see where you have all the cracks in the pavement um, because, because there's there's no more, there's nothing going on. And and ask why. See how they're connected. Also, we need to we need to connect our revenues with our expenses. We need to look at cities for what they are, which is basically really big real estate development projects that we all happen to live and work in. So connecting the cost of the cities to how we use them is critically important and getting past biases of what we think are there. The, the biggest problem that I see with cities, and we're talking with the Government Finance Officers Association about this, and how they do the CAFR standard or the GADSB, or use, utilize the GADSB, is that roads are listed as assets. Now, now in, in, in my world, my computer's an asset. If I had delivery vehicles, those are assets. Or if I had um, uh, uh, buildings, like a hot dog stand, those are assets. So I can sell you the building, the truck, or the computer. Can you sell your road? No. You can't sell your road, you can't sell your pipes, you can't sell your sidewalk, those are all liabilities. And if we just shifted the way that we lied about cities from an asset mentality to a liability uh, mentality, 
we'd see a different reality. And that's all the work of Strong Towns and what Chuck Marone uh, presents tells us that. Now, conversely, if we're gonna really treat our cities like asset management, let's look to the real estate industry and how they do it. So if you're a real estate developer and you own this mall, that's an asset. You're gonna own that mall in your portfolio and you need to maintain it. There are things that break and fail and constant reinvestment that you have to do in that product. So air conditioners have a useful life. So there's two air conditioners, they're super costly at $85,000 a pop, and it's gonna cost you 35,000 to bring out a helicopter and you know a crew to kind of put them in place. And that has to be done every 15 to 20 years because that's when those, those pieces of equipment die. So as an asset manager, you have to save a little piece of rent every single month to build up about $250,000. That money doesn't magically fall from the sky because that equipment is super expensive. Well, the same is true of a road. So if we took an asset management approach to looking at our cities, we'd see a completely different city and you'd see how you're losing your money all over the place. Because again, we don't have that money. We just hope that it happens. Or what we'll do is we'll cut services. We won't fix a park. We won't build a greenway. We won't do affordable housing all necessary stuff in the city because we need to fix a road or a pothole. So if we can measure our gains and losses and be honest with our citizens, we'll go a long way to better equipping our communities to be healthy and, and honest about what's happening. Um, and let me just jump to the end because we're about out of time and I'm gonna try to find a way to get Kate back into this. Um, and uh, just, to, just to close, um, you know, we, this, we're in a crisis um, and we just all need to be um, intellectually curious and honest about how our cities operate and we need to make the, the information easy to see. Uh, we obviously advocate for visuals and putting stuff on a map um, so that people can see it and see it in a macro way. Um, in every presentation I say, we need to do the math on this stuff. The math is difficult, it's complicated, but it's completely necessary in how we look at our municipalities. Um, if you want to read about more about our work, um, there's, there's, we have videos online. We have a channel on YouTube uh, with a bunch of videos. Uh, you can, you can come back to this lab once a month. Uh, there are several books that have covered our work uh, that we recommend to everyone. Um, and finally, oops, come back uh, next month, uh, June 25th. We'll be doing this again. Uh, pass it on to your friends. Send us some more questions. Um, we enjoy doing this, and um, if you're interested in doing a project with us, reach out to Kate Ryba. Um, feel free to take a screenshot of this, or we'll have this on video online. And if you need me to do a lecture in your community, feel free to reach out to Caitlin Nellis Masters. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, look forward to seeing you next month. So uh, let me try to unshare and see if that lets Kate back in, because I, I know that you all can hear her and I can't. Um, or maybe, uh, let's see. Kate, are you there now? Can you hear me, Joe? No. While Joe's doing that, I just want to let everyone know you'll get a link um, with a video recording of this webinar um, sometime in the next several days. So you'll have access to that. Kate, I'm making you a presenter to see if you can talk to me now. Can you, you hear me? Can you hear me, Joe? Kate? No. All right, everybody, have a great day and thanks so much for joining us. And All I'm right, sure I apologize for this difficulty. We'll we'll hey. um uh figure this out for the next time. Uh this is only our second time using the webinar software for a large group like this. And um with that I want to thank you all for your time. It's uh we're right at two o'clock and uh hopefully we'll see you next month. Take care and be safe, everybody.